So, as you may know, every now and then I talk about religion, but lately I've been wondering about the psychology of religion. What psychologically causes religion and what makes it tick? What makes one religious? So when I want to learn something, what I normally do is look it up and find out. And well, here's what I found. Now, for those of you who care, this video may not be 100% scientific. I do the best that I can to make sure that everything I say is backed up by research and data and scientific study and whatnot. But in the end, I'm not an expert. I'm not a psychologist. I'm just a guy that has access to Google Scholar. But I think that what I found is pretty interesting. And you might too, especially since you clicked on this video about the psychology of religion. So if you're not interested in the psychology of religion, why are you here? I should also say before we begin that I'm approaching this from a non-religious standpoint, so I'm not going to say that any one religion is true or not, and it may be offensive potentially if you're a devout believer, but I don't mean to be offensive. Just imagine that everything I'm saying just applies to another religion that you don't agree with. Now, what I was curious about first and foremost is why people become religious. That is, why they convert to any particular religion or start to believe in any particular divinity or spirituality. And it seems that it is not because of cold hard facts and logic and apologists and apologetics. Mostly because no one really changes their minds or starts to agree with someone or starts to believe something because of cold hard facts and logic and debates and arguments. The human mind doesn't actually work that way, or at least not exclusively, and you don't really think that way unless you have a very particular way of thinking, which we'll get to later. Now, if you were to ask an apologist why people become religious or why they became religious or started to believe their particular religion, they may or may not give you a canned answer that they learned in theology class. But if you were to ask the normal everyday churchgoer why they converted or started to believe their religion, you would get widely different answers, which I think boil down to two things. The first is that it's emotional, which is highlighted in the statements that you might hear in a testimony, such as, I can see what he's done for me, or I can feel his presence. And it's no secret that in churches, especially new, more modern churches with new, more modern music, that you can have a very emotional experience. But those statements, being seeing what he's done for me or feeling his presence, can be explained with superstition and pareidolia, which are two different ways of saying that they're seeing patterns where there might not actually be any patterns. Prayer is actually a good example of superstition, because sometimes when you pray and ask for something that is, well, reasonably likely to happen without divine intervention, sometimes you get it. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes your wish is granted. Sometimes it's not. But in a way, that actually reinforces the idea that prayer does work, even though, you know, scientific study and research shows that it does absolutely nothing supernatural. And this is partly because of a phenomenon called selective perception, where you're more likely to remember the times that your prayer was answered, and you're more likely to think of those as very significant and supporting your beliefs, whereas you're not as likely to remember or recall times where prayer wasn't answered, and you're generally not going to think of them as significant. If you pray for something that may or may not happen, then it can be pretty much random whether or not it does happen and your prayer is answered. And that sort of random getting what you want actually makes it more likely for you to exhibit that behavior. So, psychologically, because of our cognitive bias, well, we're superstitious, and prayer appeals to that. Personal testimonies, like the ones that I've heard in church growing up, might also include themes like someone recovering from an illness 
much quicker than they would have, or, say, a potentially threatening condition not actually affecting an individual as much as it could have. And this will be interpreted as the will of a higher power, or a being looking down on you, or uh, controlling some aspect of your life. And this idea that there is a being, an intelligence, or some sort of supernatural will imposed on our lives is a form of pareidolia. Again, seeing patterns where there aren't necessarily patterns, because after all, it's not uncommon for people to recover from illnesses that other people don't recover from, especially with, you know, modern medicine. But pareidolia is interpreting this pattern as human-like. In this instance, you know, will being imposed or a being controlling our lives. Whereas, you know, these things might just be normal and exaggerated as well. Research also supports the idea that sudden conversions are associated with insecure childhood personal attachments, which they may be compensating for in their supernatural beliefs. Okay, that was a bit technical, but here's what that means. A childhood insecure personal attachment is when you are a child, or as you're growing up, you may not have been able to become attached or to bond with someone else, especially, you know, adults, parents, uh, guardian, brothers, what have you, out of fear for one reason or another. Now, this doesn't mean that everybody who suddenly converts has parental issues, but it is more so than those who slowly convert or slowly change their religious beliefs. And those who change their minds slowly were more likely to have secure childhood attachments. And because they were able to bond and socialize with say, their parents, then they were better able to adopt their attachment figures, or parents' belief. Which brings me to my next point. Not only is a religious conversion emotional in nature, but they are also social and cultural in nature. You might say socio-cultural, you see? Now, this fact is pretty clearly demonstrated by the fact that well, if you're born in the Middle East, you're far more likely to be Muslim than you are to be Hindu. Likewise, if you were born in India, you're far more likely to be Hindu than, say, Christian. You know, here where I live, of course, Christians will insist that Christianity is the true religion and that every other religion is wrong. They have it right. And even more than that, different denominations, different types of Christianity will assert that their denomination and the way they see Christianity is the true Christianity. All the other Christians are wrong, and this is the form of Christianity that you should believe in, because that's the right one. But it's interesting when you consider that every other denomination and every other religion in the world sees their own religion in the exact same way, and you would be saying that exact same thing of a totally different religion if you simply grew up in a different culture. And we know that because that's exactly what they do in other cultures. Well, depending on the culture, I guess, some are more polite than others. But how exactly does this happen? How do you adopt a religion from your culture or society? Well, from a process called indoctrination. Now, I know what you're thinking. I, I know that sounds rude. But I, I don't mean it as a pejorative. I don't mean to use it as a buzzword. I mean it as it was originally intended. In fact, the church were the first ones to use the term indoctrination, and it wasn't supposed to be a bad thing. And they stopped using the term once it gained its negative connotations. But, I mean, think about it. Think about the word indoctrination. Doctrine, as in religious doctrine. It literally means to instill someone with a doctrine. And that isn't in itself a bad thing. I mean, hell, parenting, to some extent, is indoctrination. But parenting isn't per se nefarious. Or at least it shouldn't be. There are 
There are some parents out there. But basically what that means is that you are taught a set of beliefs or understandings or doctrine without the intention of thinking of it critically or examining it critically. And sometimes that is actively discouraged. And whether this is in a uh, school setting, like a theology class or catechism, or if you're just being brought up religiously by your parents, this is essentially what's going on. And again, that doesn't necessarily make it a bad thing. But apologetics is not the same thing. For those of you who don't know, apologetics is essentially the answers to, or the answering of, criticisms of religion, or uh, questions of a particular religion. It's essentially a religion, or a person in a religion, trying to defend their religion with, you know, arguments and this and that. What they're doing is actually justifying their religion or their beliefs. And I know that sounds obvious, but what's key here is that they are justifying these things after they've already came to the conclusion. People aren't going to come to the conclusion that a religion is correct, and they're not going to convert to a religion from hearing a debate or hearing an apologist. And that is because, like I said at the beginning of this video, people don't change their minds because they're presented with arguments and facts and logic that contradict what they already believe in. It, people are far more likely to change their minds or to adopt a certain set of beliefs if they process it centrally instead of peripherally. Okay, again, getting technical, but what that means is that you're more likely to change your mind or become religion if you're the one that uh, thinks about it and comes up with the ideas, more or less, or comes up with ideas that are in line and agree with whatever the idea is, in this case, religion. Like, for example, if I were to come up to a Bible thumper, a, a good God-fearing Christian man, and say that the Bible is almost entirely wrong about everything that Jesus never performed miracles, and that the Bible should be interpreted historically and not literally, well, they're not going to have any of that. They are going to completely disagree, and they're not going to change their minds. No matter how many arguments I give them, I could give them direct proof that I'm right, they're wrong, and they're not going to change their mind. Because that contradicts the way they're already thinking. That contradicts the beliefs, understandings, and thoughts that they already have. The way that they would change their minds about this matter is if they thought about it themselves, they came up with potential problems with the Bible, and they sort of created their own new understanding of what the Bible is, and came to it, you know, of their own volition. And, and the same thing goes for the other way around. An apologist standing in the street corner trying to give out all of these proofs that God exists or that the, the uh, worldwide flood really truly did happen, honest, they're not going to convert any atheist who already strongly disagrees with them. The apologist or preacher on the street corner is only going to convert those people who are already inclined to believe in such things, or who already believe in similar things. Like, like if I believed in some sort of higher power but didn't really know uh, what it was, if I felt like there was an overall purpose, or that this higher power more or less cared about our lives, or that, you know, supernatural things happen, if I believed that, and then someone were to introduce the idea of Christianity to me, I'd be far more likely to accept it than, say, an atheist would hearing a preacher yelling through a microphone about whatever. Okay, so, so far we've established that converting to religion is emotional and sociocultural, but what if we removed social and emotional factors? Would people not convert? Would people not be religious? 
Well, luckily, or, well, unluckily, there are a set of people who lack emotional and social skills, like those who are on the autism spectrum. That's people who have Asperger's, autism, pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified, or childhood disintegrative disorder, which now I don't mean to be insensitive about this matter. These are very real conditions which can have very big impacts on, you know, people's lives. But the point remains that they don't have as good social or emotional skills as would, say, a neurotypical person. So what about them? Are they less religious? Well, there's actually been quite a bit of debate about that, but it seems, overall, they are indeed less religious than those who aren't on the autism spectrum. And I suspect that that is because those who are on the autism spectrum think in a more rational, logical, straightforward way than do other people who yeah, do think rationally and straightforward, but also, in large, think in an emotional and social way. But, of course, like I said, those who are on the autism spectrum, those factors don't affect them as much. Now, that doesn't mean that every atheist is on the spectrum or that they have mental disorders, but that does bring me to my next sort of topic of interest, religiosity and mental health. Now, there's actually been quite a bit of debate around this, or at least there was. There might still be debate. I'm not entirely sure. I don't understand scientific drama, but it seems that while there's data to support both sides, it seems that those who are more religious tend to have better mental health. Now, this could be because of several reasons. Like I've often said, religion can very well be used as a coping mechanism, so the religious may be better able to deal with loss and tragedy. And because religion is a huge part of virtually every society and virtually every culture, a ability to practice a certain religion can correlate with social skills and can better help you fit in with a society and whatnot. In general, religion or conversion can largely affect your goals, your values, your outlook, and your self-worth, and the way that you believe or practice a religion can uh, change its effects. But it seems the effect or correlation between religiosity and mental health may not be huge, and they may not be causal, meaning that one might not cause the other, but instead, as is more likely, there's probably another variable at play. And while they may not have a causal relationship, religion might actually be useful in therapy. I'm not saying that every therapist should uh, convert everyone, but that if someone is religious already, then a therapist may be able to use that to help the individual, potentially. I couldn't find any further research on this, or at least not much. But that's pretty much all the info I found in the time I spent researching this topic. I hope it was interesting. I hope it wasn't too dry or boring, this video. But um, when I started making this video, I actually didn't have a whole lot of point in doing so. This was just something that I wanted to research. But as I continued to work on this video, I more or less learned something that religion, for better or worse, is normal. Now, I am, and most of my viewers and subscribers are, atheists, the skeptic types. And sometimes we lose track of just the way most people process and think of things and come to conclusions. I don't think that there will ever be a day where no one is religious, everyone is atheist, everyone is just strong, rational, skeptically minded people. Because I don't think there will ever be a day 
where people think more logically and rationally than they do emotionally or socially or intuitively. And within the last year or so, I've actually learned something that I find quite valuable, something that I haven't really thought about before, and that's the fact that there's a difference between being rationally, logically, or technically correct and being emotionally correct. And both of those are just as valid, but in totally different ways and for totally different reasons. I mean, I'm sure all of you out there watching, there's something about your parents that I can say that is just rude and insulting, even if it may be technically true, if I were just to flat out say, hey, your mom is this, your dad is this, this is what they did when they were young, or whatever. I'm sure there's something out there that is an uncomfortable truth that is true, but if I were to tell you that straight up, you would not have it. If I were to insult your mother or father in a way that was technically true, you would have none of it. Unless, of course, you don't like your parents, or you don't think emotionally either. But the, the, the point is, whether or not it's technically correct might not be emotionally correct. Certain things you do or say, or certain decisions you make, can be emotionally correct, whether or not it's logically correct. And that is just as valuable. And it's human nature to be emotional, to be intuitive, to be superstitious, and to be indoctrinated. And to some extent, those of us who are not spiritual, not religious in any way, we're the odd ones out. And I don't think that's going to change.